how it's been changing. And I think to better understand anything that is changing, that is evolving, or if we have to sort of rethink it, uh, it's always good to go to its origins. And while I was doing a little bit of research into all this, um, one of the lighthearted things that I found out about news was that it's an acronym for notable events, weather, and sports. Well, that certainly does fit, but uh, to some degree. And while the news or the media of today does depict day-to-day uh, -day events, it also is transformed into a mechanism that produces narratives for global events. And when you look at the global media's coverage, especially lately, of the Arab uprisings, we saw Imran Garda and the second panel dig deeper into that, or the failed coup here in this country just last summer, or Brexit, or even the 2016 presidential elections in the United States, we see that the media is becoming, is changing, and it's be transforming from being just a sole provider of information into more of a policy influencer. Hello and welcome to the day's last session discussion. Over the next 90 minutes, sorry, 69 minutes, we'll be attempting to dig deeper into uh, responsible reporting, especially on humanitarian crises. Uh, before we dive in and dig deeper, I'd like to take this opportunity and introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, please help me welcome them to the stage. First up, we have Mr. Rodney Dixon. He's a barrister specializing in international criminal and humanitarian law. Rodney, if I could get you up here. Great to have you here. Put you in the first seat over here. Uh, second up, we have Rasul Sardar Atash. Not only is he one of my bosses, um, but he's also the director of programming as well as the managing editor at my network, Tier 2 Worlds. Rasul? Next to Rodney. Sarah Helm is up next. She is a journalist and author. She's previously worked for the Sunday Times as well as the Independent, plus more. We're going to get into that. Sarah, if we can have you up here. Hi. Great to have you on. Thank you. They're all recognizable faces, but one from the screen, uh, Nicole Johnston. She is one of our senior correspondents. Um, I look up to her. I've learned so much from you, Nicole. Great to have you on. Thank you, mate. And finally, we're joined by Simon Marks. He is another recognizable face for our viewers at TRT World. He is the president and chief correspondent for FSN or Future Story News. Welcome to someone. So thank you very much. So we're undoubtedly going through one of the greatest changes in history in terms of media, whether it's the speed it's delivered, the intensity, as well as the magnitude. While a popular way to sort of describe this transformation in media in the last decade or so has been uh, the shift from analog to digital, that's not the only way. There is a much larger picture. People indeed are switching their media consumption habits from analog to digital, but not because they find it, they're listening to an audio clip or watching a video is easier or perhaps uh, arguably a more enjoyable experience through PCs, tablets, or even smartphones. But the greatest change in media is that within the span of a human generation, people's access to information has shifted from a relatively limited scope to a massive surplus. Simply put, there is so much out there. Just a generation ago, access to information for the majority of the world's population consisted of reading just a couple of local newspapers, having access to perhaps just as many radio channels or te television stations. Now, today, 
Billions of people have access to all of the world's information, whether they're at home, at the office, or on the go. So the economic, historical, and societal ramifications of this massive change that we're seeing in media will be far more important, will be far more profound than perhaps Gutenberg's invention of the movable type, or even Tesla and Marconi's pining efforts in broadcasting. So I want to end my opening comments by stealing a quote from one of my favorite superheroes, Spider-Man, and that is, with great change comes great responsibility. just outside a courthouse in Rebel Held Azaz near the Turkish border. The powerful explosion caused devastation in the town center, with rescuers having to get past fires to reach the injured. All right, let's get started. Um, so as we slowly sort of transition into the humanitarian crisis of our discussion, I think a good starting point uh, for all of us would be to find out how the media actually shapes public opinions as well as government policies. I just want to make a reminder, um, let's make this as conversational as possible. It's, uh, I think we get, get some engaging, all of us come with a vast amount of experience. So let's get started. Rasul, I want to start with you, not that because you're my boss, but um, as the managing editor for Turkey's um, public broadcaster, um, when you look at today's ever so changing landscape in the media, talk to us about how important um, editorial guidelines are. Uh, thank you, Ali. Uh, we are colleagues at, at, at first, so no worries uh, about me being boss. A uh, couple of years ago, uh, I was when I was working uh, for an international news organization. A team from the channel has been deployed to Bosnia to cover a uh, couple of the current affairs issues. I was a member of the team as field uh, and senior planning producer, which I was working with a very famous and well-known correspondent by that time. One of we, our should, package, we shouldn't ask the name, right? No, I'm not going to name okay, it. Right. Uh, one of our package uh, was about the prisoners during the uh, Bosnian war. The Serbian forces uh, during the war have built a camp for the Bosnians who were captured and uh, these prisoner, prisoners have been kept in that camp for more than a year. The camp was located in the town of Wishegard uh, alongside to the Drina River, which is a famous river that divides Bosnia. For more than a year, thousands of men and women have been kept in that camp, and according to the statements of the survivors, uh, the camp was being used as a facility by the Serbian forces as a place for torture and for sexual service. Among the, among the prisoners of the war, there were about 600 uh, of women as well. So from, for more than a year, hundreds of the women have been raped systematically in that camp by Serbian forces while men being under heavy tortures. So according to the post-war records, 
that had revealed what happened in the camp. About a thousand of the prisoners had been killed under the torture and in that camp, and hundreds of women have been raped. In Bosnia, every year, there is a commemoration of that tragic, traumatic event. Journalists, politicians, survivors, citizens go to that camp place and commemorate the event. So there is a bridge connecting both sides of the rivers, and the camp just takes place at the western side of the Drina River. So survivors, as I said, goes there and they, to commemorate the victims, they lead a thousand of roses to the Drina River. Each of the roses symbolically uh, represents one of the uh, victims. And when I was on that deployment, uh, people have gathered there again and we were covering that story. And one of the speakers uh, was a survivor of the camp whose name was Eliasa. I still remember the words uh, from her because it was unbelievable to see that a human being can commit such crimes against the human beings. It was stunning, shocking, horrifying. Quoting from Eliasa, she has been raped for more than a six months, every day and multiple times. On the bridge, I could see the pain on her face while she was talking about what she has been gone through. That old days were haunting her still. And Ilyasa told us that when, while she was being raped, she could hear the scream of her husband and son behind the, the wall under the torture. So yes, her husband and son also were being kept in the same camp as the war prisoners by the Serbian forces. Eliasa has survived, but her husband and son could not. They have died under the tortures. Eliasa was saying, I remember that, she was very much upset about what happened to her husband and son, uh, and even for a period of time, she was blaming herself for their death. But then, according to her, she realized that actually they are lucky that they died because uh, she knew that these tragic, traumatic memories would haunt them till the end of their life. They were lucky because Ilyasa was being haunted by her memories and she was saying that she still feels that every day she is being raped and she still hears the scream of her husband and son under the torture. According to her, she was feeling like a living death. These are her words. I was stunned, shocked, horrified, really, from what I have heard from her. Then the time to throw or to leave the roses to the river has just came, and I also picked up one of the roses to leave that to the river. That very famous, my colleague, very famous, well-known correspondent, he just, with a panic, asked me what am, I do, what am I trying to do. And I said, I will leave a rose to the river just to join the commemoration of the victims because if you're, each of the roses symbolizes one of the victims. And he strictly warned me that I can't do that because as we are journalists, we are supposed to be objective. And if I do that, I will lose my objectivity and I will be a biased journalist. Even he tried me of talking to HR to initiate an investigation about the quality of my journalism. So I think for us as journalists, when we talk about the editorial guidelines, it is really time to check our editorial guidelines and especially the term objectivity. Does a journalist will really be biased in the case of leaving a rose to the river, which symbolizes the victims of the war, symbolizes those who have been raped, those who have been, those who have been killed under the torture? 
I think this is personal idea, of course, or personal opinion. I think by getting under the cover of the term of the objectivity, we journalists are actually somehow avoiding the truth itself in many cases. We are journalists, we are professionals, but at the end of the day, we are human beings who have a heart. And we need to make a clear difference between the objectivity and the fairness. Are we supposed to be objective or truth-telling? I think, I say not neutrality, but being truthful. Not objective, but truth-telling. Not objective, but fair and balanced. That we can make sure we are making a difference between the killer and the victim. I personally do not see a problem of taking sides of the victims, it's taking sides of children or women, those who have been disadvantaged, and those who have not the opportunities of making their voice heard. Because what can somehow justify systemic rape? What can justify killing a child? What can justify mass atrocities? And what can deprive us from taking their sides? It is clear that we are supposed to be objective in the case, I mean, are we really supposed to be objective in the case or being brave and putting our heart to the story and yes, taking the sides of the victims without no hesitation. We are journalists but we have a heart, and I think putting our heart into the story is not a violation of the journalistic principles. I'm not talking about sloppy, lazy, cheap, cheesy, sentimental journalism, but trying to say responsible reporting requires to be brave and to serve to the public interest to make sure we journalists raise an awareness related to the crimes and make sure that this doesn't repeat again by making a difference between victim and the murderers and call them to the account. So you have objectivity on one side and truth telling on the other. So I'm mean, going to turn to you. Um, your company provides content to not only TRT World but also other international organizations. Um, how do you see um, a story, a similar story, pan out with different audiences? Can I, can I just very quickly pick sure. up on what Rasul said? Because I think he's very um, uh, pugnaciously uh, laid out an issue that faces all of us in different parts of the world. I toil in Washington, D.C., which, as you can imagine at the moment, is a madhouse. And this issue of objectivity uh, is constantly raised uh, with, as you know, Donald Trump maintaining that lots of the stories that we tell as media are fake news and they haven't really happened and we're not being objective. I, I take the view that actually if you're going to be objective in your coverage of the Trump administration, objective in the pure form of the word, you actually have to keep pointing out to people that what's taking place in Washington is completely abnormal, is nothing like anything that we've seen in the history of the modern presidency. So when I'm on the air and I refer to the White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, or her predecessor, Sean Spicer, I would be lacking in objectivity if I then did not add the phrase, who has shown a remarkable propensity to lie from behind the White House podium? Because if I don't say that, I'm implying that somehow there is an equivalence between Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Sean Spicer and everybody that has preceded them as White House press secretaries, Republicans and Democrats, none of whom has shown the same propensity to lie from behind the White House podium. So I think this issue of objectivity, I think Rasool is absolutely right. To be objective, you don't necessarily have to remove yourself entirely from the story because sometimes if you do that, you fall into the trap of then not being objective. Um, uh, to answer the question you asked, Alachan, I actually, pugnaciously myself, would like to poll the audience because it will help me, I think, ground myself.
I would like to know, is there anybody in this room, and you can be honest because it's, we're just among us, right? Is there anybody in this room who cares about O.J. Simpson? Is there anybody in this room who, if I said to you, you're never, ever, ever going to hear another thing about O.J. Simpson, would be troubled by that decision? Not a single hand. Well, and it was I'll kind of important for me because <laughs> when I was going to college, that was the first televised cor uh, um, court proceeding that I, that, I, that I watched. That's because we're both of a certain age. Okay. So I I'll tell you why I asked the question. Because um, it really hit home for me about three weekends ago. I'm sitting at home, and as, and as Alachan said, I provide news for a number of different uh, broadcast networks around the world. And it's just, it's just an astonishingly crazy weekend in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump is tweeting every hour about the National Football League and the players who have been taking the knee uh, as an act of protest during the national anthem. A story that he has invented, an act of total diversion for members of the public. He wants members of the public to look over here at this national anthem story because he doesn't want them looking over here at three and a half million Americans who are, are without power and without water in Puerto Rico as a result of the hurricane that has engulfed Puerto Rico and his own government's lamentable response to what's taking place there. In, in every sense, a humanitarian crisis right on America's doorstep that continues uh, taking place today. Meanwhile, you know, the, the human tide of traffic out of Myanmar towards Bangladesh as the Rohingya uh, continue to leave, that's also making global headlines. Uh, there's no shortage of stories that one could be reporting from Washington, D.C., and I get a phone call from one of my, uh, one of my uh, broadcast clients, not, I hasten to add, TRT World, who says, O.J. Simpson's being released from prison tomorrow. Can you, can you cover it? To which there are two possible answers. Yes, I can cover it, which I'm afraid is not the answer I gave. The other possible answer is, yeah, I can cover it, but why would you want to? Why would that be the choice that you're making editorially, that your audience really wants to hear, as opposed to us going off to Puerto Rico and talking about humanitarian issues there, or uh, informing the audience in the UK about the... Uh, the issue pertaining to uh, Rohingya Muslims. So I, I think that, you know, and I don't, it, it's, I don't want to be stereotypical or, or make generalizations no. out of it because clearly we're now we're working in this multipolar world and you've got a whole array of different broadcast organizations out there competing for uh, eyeballs in the international news space. Plus, of course, all the new media organizations, the citizen journalism that, that exists. I know we'll talk about this later on, but we talk a lot about the voiceless they might be voiceless, but they're not necessarily phoneless. And so their ability to put compelling testimony straight into the public domain about uh, humanitarian uh, crises that are unfolding is unparalleled in, in human history. But you do still have, you still do find yourself on occasion battling against uh, a slightly American dominated. Uh, view of world news that even sort of washes up from time to time in newsrooms far away from American shores and on occasion I think that actually objective uh, objectivity requires you sometimes to push back against that we have a lot to get into and before we get to Sarah and, and Nicole I just want to switch gears and, and bring Rodney in um, you regularly appear um, in uh, before the International Criminal Court um, in your experience how do you think the media's truth-telling has sort of uh, played a role in proceedings? I think that um, we probably wouldn't have uh, the new set of international courts without all of the media attention that came, particularly in the Yugoslav conflict, the example that, that, that was given. Uh, you, you, you may recall seeing that picture of that group of Bosnian men who were in custody uh, in a concentration camp behind barbed wire with their ribs showing. Uh, the courts hadn't been established then, and that image and the reporting around that has often been credited with the reason why the UN and politicians decided that they had to do something, because it was so powerful, it was so embarrassing for them as well. And Strikingly, interestingly, it reminded them 
this, this picture of these Bosnian Muslim men of the Holocaust from the Second World War and how people had been treated then. And the parallel that was drawn was just too, too overwhelming for this to be happening in Europe again. Uh, this was meant to be the new world order that, that had come in after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of apartheid, things were changing, and then this comes. It, it, it became such an important symbol, which the media got out there and, and promoted, that something had to be done. The courts were formed. And then you had Rwanda, the genocide of over 800,000 people just after that. Once again, because of the media furore around Yugoslavia, uh, for whatever reason, many people say there might never have been a court for Rwanda in Africa. There hadn't been one in Europe first. But once there was one in Europe, the politicians knew that they couldn't say, oh, well, we're going to forget Africa this time. They had to do something there as well. And there was the same kind of attention of the bodies on the dusty streets, the pangas that were used to kill so many people in such a short space of time, that, 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 that drove it on. Uh, and we honestly believe then that these courts would uh, make a difference. And that's a whole separate topic, whether they have and how effective the ICC is at the moment. But I, I make that point just to highlight how important the media has been in generating uh, accountability. Having said that, uh, I think the need for responsible journalism in that context becomes even more ac acutely important. Uh, and yes, there are some harrowing stories, some of these that are given now, but the work I've done as well has been on the defense side where people are accused of these kinds of things. Uh, and I've represented people where those things that were alleged, I'm not saying it didn't happen in this case, but in cases I've done, they were found to be completely made up, completely made up for political reasons to try and get the other side, to try and engineer regime change. Uh, and a lot of that came from the stories that were spread by journalists, often biased, nationalistic journalists trying to do it for their own reasons. But it just showed how important it was to, to keep a very critical eye on the evidence that, that you were getting. And you can't overlook the defense side in this. Yes, no one remembers O.J. Simpson, but, but like him, anyone who's accused of these crimes, uh, under principles of human rights, has the right to a fair and proper defense. Human rights are universal. They are there for everyone, even the people we don't like or the most reviled people in society. Mm -hmm. And that's what the rule of law champions. And ultimately, that's when you talk about reporting on these situations, so should the media. It should be about getting the information out. Yes, very important, uh, because it established these courts in many ways. But then the way in which information is gathered and produced thereafter, and the quality of that information, how it is checked. I, I often say that, that journalists are a bit like lawyers in needing to ensure reliability and, and credibility before putting the information out there. I think the other thing to bear in mind is more and more nowadays, uh, and journalists might not like this, is you being drawn into the criminal processes. You might well have to give evidence about what you saw or what you heard, and you don't have any privilege or, or immunity. So the importance of the work that you do is not only about getting it out there, but you might actually become the people who have to report on what's happening to the Rohingya at the moment or what's happening in Syria, because there's no one else there to do it. Uh, and therefore, there's an added responsibility to not be acting as a police investigator, but to gather everything you can, because you might be the final line in determining whether or not there will be accountability and a case proven, or possibly somebody being shown innocent if, if they have been wrongly accused. Uh, thank you. Sarah, I want to turn to you. When you look at your time as, as, a, as a foreign correspondent, how is the reporting, and, you, and you've done some great reporting from the Middle East to, to Bosnia, how is the reporting from those parts sort of um, uh, shaped public opinion? I think it, it obviously shapes it enormously, but I think the question to ask is, does it shape it enough? And is it shaping it any more today, despite the huge amount of media exposure that is out there, than it did, you know, uh, 70 years ago? Uh, and I, I must say, I've not only been a, a reporter in, in today's world, uh, I've also been, a, I'm also now writing books about the, the near past. Um, and uh, my last book was about a, a women's concentration camp called Ravensbrück. 
And I'm, I'd like to pick up on, on something that, uh, that, that my colleague has said about throwing roses into water. Um, Ravensbrook was the, I don't know if any of you here have heard of it. In fact, I'd be quite interested to know. Anybody know what Ravensbrook was in the room? Well, that's a very depressing uh, revelation because Ravensbrook was the only Nazi concentration camp for women. Between 50 and 90,000 women died there. Um, <clears throat> it's almost unknown outside uh, certain European countries and, amongst, among, among, uh, and, and obviously amongst certain Jewish uh, women who went through there. It wasn't a particularly a camp for Jews. It was more a camp for resistors in Europe. Um, when I first went there, the reason I draw a comparison was the survivors were throwing red roses into a lake um, at the memorial site, which is just 40 miles north of Berlin. The women I interviewed for the book, of course, said again and again, never again. This must never be allowed to happen again. It is happening again, not necessarily on the scale of the biggest crime that humanity has ever known, i.e. the uh, Nazi, the, the Holocaust of the Jews, but it is happening again, and we have been unable to stop it. Um, that's the, the reflection I have on that. This is enough, this is, it is happening again. The reporting, the uh, remembering of these crimes is not sufficient to stop it happening again. Um, I'd just like to mention a couple of points also, which I think are crucial on the objectivity point. Um, without wishing to, um, to trivialize this in any way, um, I think it's quite interesting uh, when journalists talk about their moral um, conundrum. I grew up in a very, very old-fashioned school of journalism. Uh, I was trained on a local paper in North Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. And uh, we grew up, uh, journalists know what a story is. They don't have to worry about it too much. They have an instinct. They learn and they're training what is a story. And, and it, to put it simply, we were always told, dog might, bites man is not a story. Man bites dog is a story. So you instinctively find your way through to learn when a story is a story. And I think objectivity is to some degree not something one put first. One went for the story. What was new? What was different? What hadn't been said before? Trump is new. Everything he says is new. Everything he does is a story. Um, and let's hope that he doesn't stay so long that it's no longer a story. Uh, the second thing I was going to say about objectivity is that I think, and I learned this from writing about war crimes in the past, that for journalists, and indeed for everybody concerned, the existence of international conventions, particularly the Fourth Geneva Convention, passed in 1949, precisely as a result of the uh, World War II uh, crimes, gives journalists a, a, a sense, a roadmap for judging whether something is of supreme international concern and whether it should be reported. It's a kind of control, if you like. Uh, I take, for example, look at, um, and also UN resolutions. We could look, for example, I'm now writing a book about Gaza uh, on international resolutions. When I started on the independent newspaper, we always used to refer to the uh, illegally occupied West Bank, the illegally occupied Gaza Strip. Now, we could do that in those days without any argument at all because in those days it was still recognized that the uh, UN conventions stood firm. Those sort of, that sort of language has now been blurred. So people no longer use those guidelines. The Fourth Geneva Convention has never been less uh, respected than it is today, as we know from what's going on in Syria. So I just say uh, two things. I think we, we don't, we are, unfortunately, we're not having anything like the effect that we would like to think we are. Um, I think that we need to absolutely hold fast to uh, the Geneva Conventions and other forms of international humanitarian law as our guideline when it comes to objectivity. And then we can argue our case much more strongly. Russell, do you have some feedback on this? Uh, that Nicole the call, and I will come back to that point. Okay, well, Nicole, um, you reported from, from, um, from conflict zones all across the world. Um, 
as a journalist, uh, talk to us of some of the challenges. I mean, do you feel that this affects um, you reporting from these conflict zones, the idea of responsible journalism? Well, yes, going from what Rasul had to say about his colleague saying it's not objective to throw a, a rose in the water, I think from some of my experiences over the last two years, particularly in Iraq, where you're often faced with that dilemma, and I think a lot of journalists are faced with it now, about how much should you intervene. I think journalists were also uh, faced with that with the uh, refugee crisis across Europe, you know, so many European journalists perhaps, or global journalists who hadn't dealt with these sorts of humanitarian crises before, all of a sudden they're in a situation where they're in a comfortable hotel and they're going out and seeing, you know, humanity at its, at its best and its worst on the streets. Um, and also seeing, you, you know, people, people drowning as they reach the shores of Lesbos and having that conflict about how far should they go? Should they be going in and trying to help, you know, rescue people? Uh, should they be trying to help carry bags? Sh to, to what degree should we be intervening? And I think that seems to be something that's, you know, perhaps a line that's becoming more and more blurred between journalism and advocacy. I mean, I was reading an example of a, um, a Swedish television network which had aligned itself with an NGO and sent their own boats out to rescue migrants. You know, I was also reading about a couple of Swedish journalists who ended up facing charges for attempting to, well, I think they were successful in the end, smuggle a boy from Greece to Sweden. Uh, you know, my own recent experience in, in Iraq, in the old city, uh, the cameraman and I had sort of turned up you know, to try and get those harrowing shots of people emerging from their, you know, from their houses, trapped in the old city for sort of months on end. And we arrived, we saw nothing for about 45 minutes, and we were thinking, oh, we're not going to get anything, it's just rubble, rubble, rubble. We were almost ready to get up, uh, to give up. We were with the Iraqi military, and we were being sort of pushed through as you inevitably are, it was a big rush, and then all of a sudden, just as we were ready to turn around, and there was maybe 10 of us, you know, you have that sort of horrible, those images of, of people walking out, thin, weak, in their underwear, you know, men carrying their grandmothers, skin and bones, tr struggling over the rubble, begging for water, and, and you know, your response is, okay, we need to go and film this, but also how much should we be trying to help? Because there's no one there, there's no NGOs there, there's some military there, but they're not really helping, they're just pointing them in the, in the right direction. You know, you, you wanna stand back so you can get the shots, but at some point you think, well, I should try and help some of these women with their bags over the rocks, but how much uh, you know, how much of that can you do? And then there's the issue, I mean, the safety issue, of course, of, you know, a lot of, some of these women, it, it turned out, were wearing suicide vests. I mean, more than a dozen Iraqi military were killed as they were approached uh, by women strapped in suicide vests. So I think it's a, it's, it's a very difficult uh, debate or question for people who are in conflict areas. I mean, it's something that's still not resolved. I mean, it will probably never be resolved. Um, a little bit, you know, a little bit later on, our cameraman suddenly saw a man who was just too weak to get up from the rubble in his underwear, you know, absolute skin and bones, pr the most harrowing shot that we had in, in probably the five or six months that I've spent there uh, off and on over the last couple of years. And, and uh, you know, again, you feel so sort of grubby trying to take those shots. So how do you cover a conflict in a responsible way where you're not making, you know, where you're not, I guess, damaging or impeding the, the dignity of the people that you're trying to, 
uh, trying to tell their stories. I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, we took the shots and then we walked out and the first thing that we did was tell the military, you know, there's a guy in there, you've got to go get him out, he's too weak. But, uh, you know, I'm ashamed and embarrassed to admit that I think we got too caught up in the moment and we didn't. Um, so, you know, in terms of responsible reporting in a humanitarian crisis, I mean, there's lots of different elements that you could look at. For me, that's, that's something that I always think about, you know, which is how do you tell people's stories when they're in this extraordinary situation without making it any, any worse for them than it could possibly be by sticking a camera in their face, trying to get a sound bite from them as they're, you know, running away, struggling to get away from the hell that they've been living under. And I, th I think it's a constant sort of dilemma. The only thing that I've come up with, which is what I try to do in, in that situation where possible, is, you know, when you do have time, is to take the time. You know, spend a few minutes before the cameras start rolling, you know, connect with the children, connect with the, you know, with, with the mother. I mean, very simple things, you know, shake hands, hold a hand. Can I just ask whatever you Nicole can do. a question? I, I, I'm very interested in what you're, the, the dilemma that you're talking about. I was wondering whether you've, you also think, and I'm sure you do this, but I, just because I go to Gaza a lot at the moment, I wonder, do uh, a lot of journalists, a lot of the, 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 the TV, radio journalists, do they have a tendency to go to places too much only when there's a battle on? Gaza, for example, had huge coverage during the last 2014 war. I forget the number of uh, foreign press that were there, but it was huge. I've been going there several times a year for the last couple of years, and to be quite honest, I haven't encountered more than about a handful of foreign journalists in Gaza at that time. And isn't it just as important to cover it when there isn't? Ab absolutely, a and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I lived in Gaza for a year ah. uh, with <laughs> with Al Jazeera oh, right. English. Yeah. Um, about Which year? Uh, 2011. Right. Yes, the year of the Arab Spring. So I wasn't really in the hottest place in the Arab Spring, but anyhow. Um, so I was there for that year, about, and then I spent about four months there the year before, during the Maybe Marmara crisis. I was there for the 2012 war, 2014, and I have a great soft spot for Gaza, obviously. And Jazeera, at that time, it's no longer the, the case with Gaza, but at that time it was the only international network that had a permanent presence in Gaza. And they were so paranoid about maintaining that presence that it was, you weren't there Monday to Friday and partying in Tel Aviv on the week, weekends, you were there all the time. And when you left for a holiday, someone came in at exactly the same time. And that was partly because of the 2008-2009 war when they were the only international network that, that had a presence there. But, but yes, as you say, I mean, now with Gaza, barely anyone is there reporting on it. But and the siege almost feels it. normalized now. But there's another reason for it, which I think we should mention, is as you know perfectly well, and I know, it's very difficult to get there. Israeli journalists are completely banned, for example, so uh, they don't see inside Gaza at all, which is behind a wall now. And for foreign journalists, and especially newspaper reporters, unless you're assigned by a, by a, a, a newspaper that is on the Israeli list, you can't get in because they control the border. So even getting to this, I mean, a wall is a great way to hide a story, and it still works. But Simon, also, we were talking about just a day uh, with this Rohingya crisis, too. I mean, getting there is a problem, too. Mm. Yes, I mean, I was oh. actually going to, yes. Uh, but we do have the most extraordinary tools at our disposal now. Just yesterday, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees put out drone video uh, taken from the air above the Myanmar-Bangladeshi border. And if you haven't seen it, I mean, worth going to find it. It must be all over YouTube, all over Twitter and Facebook by now. And it is the most extraordinary video that just shows this human tide of thousands and thousands of people walking down this road and uh, getting out of Myanmar. Uh, 
uh, which provides extraordinarily valuable evidence of what is actually taking place on the ground there. Certainly, reporting from that region has been very complicated. It's only been in the last few weeks that uh, reporters uh, from the major news organizations have had an opportunity actually to go in and gather witness testimony uh, about what has been taking place. But again, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, the voiceless have smartphones. They have uh, as much power, you know, everybody that's got one of these has, has as much power at their disposal as I do as a journalist, or Nicole does, or any of us have, uh, to go out into the field and tell a story. And now to disseminate that story through a whole variety of digital channels that allow it uh, to be spread, to go viral, to be relatable, as the, uh, as the phrase goes, and to have impact. A a and picking up on what uh, Nicole was just saying, you know, I mean, we do what we do, not because we are wannabe aid workers, but because we want to tell stories and because we want those stories to have impact and we want those stories to provide citizens of globalized democracies or developing world nations to have the information at their disposal with which to make responsible decisions. And the fact of the matter is, to be crass about it, you know, all the video that Nicole was just describing, that's astonishing video. That, that is what in crass moments people like me would refer to as good TV. And good TV is now virally shareable over Facebook, over Twitter. I was just in Beijing about uh, three weeks ago uh, talking with some Chinese radio executives who are uh, uh, vigorously pursuing now a video strategy. And they were explaining that based on their research, if you do a 90-second piece of internet video, you've got 1.7 seconds to keep the audience's attention. Your video has to be so compelling at the 1.7 second mark. And if it's insufficiently compelling, well, on their Facebook feed, they just, they just flick through to the next bit of video. But the honest truth is, video of these kind of humanitarian crises that we're talking about, that drone footage that the UNHCR put out yesterday, no one's flicking away from that after 1.7 seconds. And so there is now, I think, a real new way of disseminating this information and telling these stories that goes beyond television, but obviously includes television, and helps you get that information into an ever-increasing number of hands. Talking about the astonishing video that uh, Nicole was talking about and the drone footage from the Myanmar-Bangladesh uh, border, Roddy, let me ask you, do you think that these sort of images um, can help find peaceful solutions to ongoing conflicts? or let's take it a step further, even prevent them uh, in the future from, from happening? Uh, certainly, because I think that kind of material, which was never available before, and certainly when you look at historic crimes, uh, is, is, is something that is missing, uh, makes two things happen. One, it gets world attention, which is required to start investigations and accountability. It never happens unless there's that level of embarrassment that I was talking about uh, earlier on. Uh, and then secondly, it gives you the, the concrete evidence. Uh, as a prosecutor, th that's what you want. It's real-time physical evidence. It's not witnesses who could be embellishing their stories. I mean, this is what you see. It's, it's forensic evidence that uh, can be used as the first step uh, in uh, an investigation. So in, in all the cases now before these international bodies, this kind of evidence is, is more and more at the center. And we, we are seeing uh, a, a widening of these investigations. Where, wherever you look, there's one set up by the General Assembly for Syria, uh, there's, there's one in relation to Iraq, there's one in relation to Yemen as well, there should be one in relation to the Rohingyas, maybe this will be the tipping point. But the point I'm making is that if, if you're out there gathering it, yes, it, it might be very good news, but you might be called as the first witness by the prosecution to say, well, we need to authenticate this. Uh, where did you take it? What is the quality of it? I, I can tell you now there'll be people saying that it has been hacked uh, and that it has been doctored and manipulated for political reasons. And as much technology as there is out there to, to help, people will make arguments about how it can be manipulated. So you need to be ready to do that, and, and I, I don't see that there's any 
problem with journalists playing that role. Uh, I think however you look at it, uh, the way in which you gather and report involves taking an angle and people develop their stories and their reputations because of what they write and what they say. I mean, I, I know all the time when you take on clients, <coughs> you immediately get feedback from them. Go to this journalist because they are quite good on the situation. Don't go to him or her because they're going to be neutral or they're working for the other side. So it, it, it's certainly out there. Uh, it, it's not as though people don't take sides in the broader sense. But the key thing for me is that you build the case, uh, much like lawyers do, in a proper and credible way. You get all the relevant evidence together and put it as a package, which is then a record for all time. Uh, and we won't have a situation, even if it takes 25, 30, 40 years, where there's nothing to, to go back on, as, as has happened in many crimes in the past. I think because of what we're doing today, we will have that record, thanks to the work that's being done on the ground. And even if it takes a long time for the politicians to have the courage or the will to do it, there's no statute of limitations on these crimes. Maybe we'll get back to them later on. And because of the record, we'll have a basis to do it. Sir, I want to turn to you. When you look at these news gathering tools that we've been discussing, um, social media, drones, we didn't have that back in World War II. Coming back to the example of um, the concentration camp for, for, for women, um, no doubt. I and mean, when you look at wars, everyone's affected. But I think it's the women and children that are mostly, most le uh, deeply affected. Um, when you look at your experience, uh, how do these conflicts uh, um, affect uh, women in particular? It's to me what? It's a question to me? To Sarah. Oh, Sarah, sorry. Sorry, I thought you were. Um, I think they affect women hugely. And I think that uh, my, when I was working on, on the story of Ravensbrück, the women's concentration camp, uh, I thought again and again of this kind of conventional wisdom that we complacently hold, women and children first, let's protect women and children. Well, in the case of this camp, it was really women and children last. Uh, it was one of the last camps to be reached by the Allies. Uh, there was a gas chamber there after the gas chamber had closed down at Auschwitz. And uh, the story was then virtually ignored after the war because somehow it was just women and children. Historians were always largely men. It may sound trite, but I'm afraid they just weren't interested in what happened to women. Uh, it was a crime of hu huge proportions. Uh, similarly today, obviously, as we know from watching all the wonderful videos that the TV journalists do and the film and, and covering, coverage of Syria, coverage of, of, of the Middle East in general, coverage of Gaza, that women and children are in the, absolutely in the front line. And uh, the, what I, the point I would make here is that, of course, the video, the film, the footage is crucial and will be used at, hopefully at some point as evidence against the criminals, but it's not enough. For one thing, people are getting a little bit used to it. They can turn the television off. I'd like to go back to another role that journalists should play, and that is the investigative journalist. The journalist who's able to ask questions, who's able to get to those who are taking these decisions and say why. There are so many questions that are not being asked rigorously and properly by people who know how to ask them, who are trained. You say that ordinary people have a voice now. Yes, they do, and they can get on the phone, and they can post things, but they don't know how to operate as journalists, not really. They don't know how to seek out presidents, prime ministers, war criminals, and get to them and analyze the information. Um, I mean, for example, Iraq was raised in the last panel. How many British journalists asked Tony Blair and his government and the British intelligence services and indeed the intelligence services around the world, why do you really think, why are you so sure that Saddam Hussein has WMD? It was just accepted that he did. And that was a huge journalistic failing. It was a political failing, but it was a journalistic failing and it's really been uh, too easily ignored. So I think journalists should be, as well as getting to the place and getting the video, getting the film, they should be asking questions and there should be huge investment by the news media in a new form of investigative journalism because no money is put into it. Rasul, 
you're trying to grow the program department at TRT World, and I think investigative journalism is something that you want to get into. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that, the ethics when you're operating in this realm. Um, I think you know, when we talk actually about the need um, for the investigative journalism, we are coming back to the uh, responsible and credible reporting again. So starting from that point, uh, during the Nixon's, President Nixon's presidential campaign, the credibility of the media in the USA has decreased to an historical record level. It was 42%, the credibility of the media. In last year, during the presidential race between uh, Hillary Clinton, the, the, the candidate for the Democrats, and uh, Donald Trump, the credibility of the media has dropped to 36%. So these numbers are dramatic for us. And we have to see why even there is not a remarkable discussion about the credibility of the media that is being initiated by journalists themselves. It is time for us actually to question ourselves. So what we have done, I mean in international media and international journalists, what we have done that we created an environment that 64% out of 100 do not believe us. They think that we are lying. So basically our job is to inform people, right, to give the information. And people do not believe that we are giving them the information. People think that we are manipulating them. People think that we are lying to them. And people think that we are tricking them or fooling them. So starting from that point on, I think it's very much dramatic. The reasons that I could imagine or I could think what are the reasons and the factors behind this and the failure of the credibility in the media, especially when the media is so much diversified. I think first the newsrooms, international newsrooms, do not reflect the average of the society. Mostly the newsrooms are being dominated by very much ideologically motivated groups or individuals. And while they're reporting, their priorities actually is being determined by that ideological, psychological uh, uh, filters. Second, the fact-checking process, which was an old way of journalism, and I think it was very much healthy and working, the fact-checking process now is definitely not working, and that is creating a sloppy journalism. Third, when the journalists are reporting about the serious issues, especially for the countries like Turkey, like Russia, Iran, or China, when they lie, when they do not go through the fact-checking process, when they do not have an investigation, a proper pre-investigation process, they know that their credibility is not going to be at stake. They know that their credibility is not going to be disputed. Because most probably no one will care about whether that information about Turkey is true or not. Whether that information is true about President Putin or not, or China or Iran and so on, it is so much easy for lots of the international journalism as to give very much manipulative, sometimes even baseless, very much sloppy journalism and reporting, and they know that their credibility is not going to be at the stake, is not going to be questions, and they are not going to be held into the account. So it seems to me that in this age, yes, people are not believing the international journalism, or sorry, international channels are not believing us. 64% of people do not believe us. They think that we are lying. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean that they are not being appealed by our rhetoric. So I think media sees an opportunity here. It seems to me that the international media, they do not want people to necessarily believe them but they want people just to watch them, which is an important difference and we need to rebuild an ethical code. So it is time to build a new workable ethical codes, especially in the times that the media is so much diversified and manipulative. So by the rise of the new media, I think, rise of social media, digital platforms, and so what is left for us 
for traditional journalists, especially for TV journalists and the print journalists, what, are, what is left for us? I think that maybe the most efficient pro platform for us is in the time of the dis dis disinformation, in the times of the breaking news and so on. It's almost impossible to be in a competition with the new media, right? So the position that is left to us, the platform that we can still compete and can build ourselves again, is a platform of giving accurate, credible, and in-depth journalism. And that is most probably what is actually Sarah was trying to, uh, to, to emphasize about the necessity of the investigative journalism. So coming to TRT, well, I'm going to keep that short. Briefly. So, yes, we are creating a team that directly is being uh, somehow motivated by these principles, and they're working on very more, much important projects. I think very much soon this is going to be on screen. Thank you. Mr. So, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the timer. I see that we have less than 10 minutes on. Um, we have panelists here that have an enormous amount of experience. So uh, I want to turn, uh, we'll give it to you guys. I want everybody to put on their journalist caps and, and, and ask questions to, to Rodney, to Rasul, to Sarah, to Nicole, and to, and to Mark. So questions? Maybe the microphones over here? <clears throat> Up front. Uh, hello, uh, Rana John and Jamart from Cartel and Tolimo Metapie School. Uh, I would like to ask that, as you stated, uh, you know, some news uh, that uh, the uh, international media delivers. Um, can be manipulated by the, according to some state's benefits or some company's benefits or someone's benefits. So do you, do you think does uh, media or journalists has uh, authority or uh, capability about uh, changing the politi policy of some countries or uh, affecting the politicians or some uh, ways of the uh, huge companies or strategies? Is that question to who? Who is that you? Yeah, who, who uh, want to answer? Okay, sir, then I think you should go. Um, well, uh, I mean, I think clearly uh, well-rooted, uh, grounded, verified, independent journalism clearly has the potential to inform people and thus alter the outcome, for example, of elections, uh, it can absolutely uh, alter the uh, dynamic of corporate decision making. Take a look at what's happened to Uber, for example, uh, over the last six months or so. Much of that has been driven by uh, journalism that uh, arose out of uh, complaints that uh, members of Uber's staff and some of its, uh, its passengers uh, uh, raised with journalists. So I think there's no doubt about that. I, I, I do think, though, that any organization that's in this industry now that, that worries about, and, and has to worry, as Rasul was saying, about its own credibility, has to find a way of making sure that any user-generated content that it's deploying in its television reporting or any other reporting, anything that you pull in from Twitter or you pull in from Facebook, or drone footage that's put out by the UNHCR, you need to verify that what you're seeing in that footage is actually yeah. what took place. Uh, and so, you know, news agencies, networks are now beginning to invest substantial amounts of money in some cases in creating desks that do precisely that. Mm -hmm. Engaging in that business of verification becomes hugely, hugely important. It also becomes hugely important for the legal issues that Rodney was talking about. Sarah, do you have any insight on that? Uh, yes, I think it, I, th uh, I agree. As long as the, uh, the, the story that is being written has been factually uh, verified, it goes back to my point that you need experienced journalists. You need social media, of course, but you need to bring back and give uh, authority. You give respect in a way, and they need to uh, they need to warrant that respect to investigative journalists. And there have been huge uh, numbers of cases. I mean, just thinking of the British press in the days when it was something to be respected. The Sunday Times newspaper, for example, in the 70s and 80s broke a, a, a number of huge stories which changed, changed government policy. 
I mentioned just the thalidomide case, which was a, a drug case, a, a terrible drug that uh, babies were born disabled. Um, this was exposed by the Sunday Times along with enough, another, a number of other great investigative stories. It can change government policy, but it's got to be very, very good journalists of the best quality. We had a second question here. Yes? Hello. Um, I work in the humanitarian field and um, specialize in emergency response where there's a disaster or a conflict or migration. And I find myself uh, often with journalists at the same time, almost. So uh, I remember back in 2011, I was in Hatay when first time Syrians arrived and there was the whole world media was there because Angelina Jolie was there for the same reason why I was there. I was doing, not for the same reason, but sorry, for the Syrians was there. Um, the whole world media being there, I mean, we have similarities with journalists. Um, something happens, something is happening, there we go, we have a job, work to do, and actually it's a tragedy. It's somebody else's tragedy. But it's an opportunity for us, a career opportunity, and also what we discuss here, a responsibility. We have accountability rules. I mean, what journalists have to be accountable? I mean, when you go somewhere, you bring attention and obviously money of donations and so forth. Sometimes too much for an emergency that, um, so, there are hot spots in the world. Um, 60 places that where all the money goes, but at the same time there are places that uh, um, a scale, uh, could, compared could we get your scale, question? sorry, could we get question, to your question is the, what do you have the accountability rules for journalism to be, um, to do uh, journalism uh, responsibly and uh, how do you deal with the aftermath after you leave because you don't always bring money and happy ending. Sometimes you bring people in security and more vulnerability. And secondly, how do you cope with your secondary trauma? I'm sure you do also share this with humanitarian workers. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Nicole, you spent your time in, in these type of uh, environments. This is right up your alley. What's the first question again? In terms of accountability. I mean, I think I was trying to make that point a little bit before, as you said, there's a lot of similarities between how journalists are sometimes working in the field and, and humanitarian aid workers. So many um, spokespeople now for aid organisations are former journalists anyway, and I find in a lot of situations they're almost being used in some respects as de facto correspondents, almost, by news organisations that can't get into Yemen, don't want to spend the money to go to Yemen or other parts of the world, so they're relying on the spokesperson for Save the Children to give their account of it, to use their pictures. So I, I think that we've become very reliant, um, too reliant on NGOs. I think there's a risk there as as journalists work with advocates or with NGOs that if they're getting their access through the NGO, that maybe they'll be too soft on the NGO, maybe they'll become uh, too, too involved with the NGO. In terms of the accountability of journalists in a humanitarian crisis, I, I'm not sure what you've seen. I don't know that there is a lot of accountability. You know, most people I know try and behave themselves. I try and behave myself. I don't want to get in the middle of aid workers. Um, while they're trying to help people and treat people. If I'm with a fixer who feels that he has to and has the ability, you know, to go in and help his, his people, which is often the case, you know, I've been in field clinics where all of a sudden your Iraqi fixer has disappeared because he's in there, you know, helping um, wrap bandages, etc. You know, I sort of step back, let them do that because I think you have to allow them to deal with uh, 
you know, as a fixer, a translator, or, or a driver, whatever guilt and trauma they might be going through in, in watching these stories unfold, the only accountability I can think of is that Hungarian uh, photographer who tripped mm -hmm. the refugees. That's the only one I can think of. As, as for people's or, or journalists' uh, personal trauma, I think that's something that the industry maybe, is... Maybe we can actually end on all that because we don't have Sorry. very much time <laughs> left. Uh, all journalists, you, um, Simon, if we talk to you, how does a journalist deal with that secondary stage? Well, I, I, I think as Nicole was about to say, there, there, are, there, there is now, I think, a great deal more focus on PTSD suffered by journalists than there ever was, you know, 25, 30 years ago. The guys coming back from Vietnam, the guys coming back from Korea had, had no access to the kind of treatment that is available now uh, to journalists. And I think you're seeing responsible news organizations uh, increasingly taking advantage of that and also uh, not penalizing journalists who come back and suffer from that kind of PTSD. It is not dissimilar to the kind of PTSD that aid workers or members of the, of, of the serving military uh, endure as well, and, and it needs to be treated with the same degree of seriousness. Sarah, some final thoughts? Um, um, I think that, uh, that, that one way that writers and journalists, but certainly speaking for myself, um, deal with it is by, first of all, journalists create a, a wonderful community amongst themselves um, there's a great camaraderie amongst journalists, uh, especially out in the field, and I think that is a sharing amongst them of their, their own experiences. And an ability to actually, you know, step back a little bit or little bit and, 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 and exchange views helps an enor enormous amount. And secondly, in my own experience, certainly as I was talking about Ravensbrück, my concentration camp, and also about Gaza, the book I'm writing at the moment, I make enormous friends as I'm going along amongst many of the people who've been victims. Um, I have great friends in Gaza. I had great friends amongst the survivors of the camp and all stories I've covered. And in a way, there's a sort of sharing in that trauma that helps you deal with it. Thank you. Uh, Rodney, I know that you're a lawyer uh, yes. and that you've been thrown in this lion's den with all these journalists, but if you have some final thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, most people don't probably have much sympathy for uh, lawyers ever. But uh, in, in fact, uh, the situation ca can become very difficult because even though you're meant to have this front of always being there to fight for your client no matter what, uh, it, it can be a completely overwhelming experience. And the difficulties, the real challenges of doing this kind of work when a lot of human rights work often doesn't end uh, in the right way, there, there just isn't justice, uh, and the politics intervenes or it just becomes impossible to get a, a result. And as a, as a result of that, there is much more focus on wellness for lawyers now as well because of the extreme pressures. But I, I think what you always have to focus on is how many of the victims that you've represented are clearly in a far, far worse position. And you have to keep, keep going. I think the message that I often discuss with a lot of my colleagues is that the best way to deal with it is, is to keep going and realize that it's only through trying over and over and over and focusing on the next challenge that you've got more of a chance and that sometimes you do get breakthroughs, things happen, and that helps the most. Russell, we can finish off with you. Well, um, remember in 2012 when the Storyful was being created, I felt so much relieved as a journalist. What was created, I'm sorry? Storyful, like the verification okay, yeah. Yeah. I felt so much relieved, which is ironic and, to be honest, a little bit sad. Because we as journalists, why should we need such verification accounts and agencies to pay money? We are paying money to the organizations actually to check us whether we are saying the truth or not. That's a little bit sad for the journalism. And recently, I don't know whether you could come across to them or not, there are lots of very much popular verification accounts on Twitter. And the regular repair team, for example, like two hours ago, BBC was reporting on that, but actually it's not that. CNN was doing that, but it's not that. New York Times was reporting that this happened, but actually it did not. And somehow, they are very much right on many occasions. And that is very much sad, and I think that's why I'm emphasizing the credibility and just the platform that the classic journalism or TV journalism or print, print journalism has is 
to that what's left for us is the accurate, in-depth, and credible journalism. That is the only platform that we can survive on. All right. Thank you. Uh, Rodney, Rasul, Sarah, Nicole, Simon, thank you very much. Great stories, a great insight. I know that I thoroughly enjoyed it. A round of applause, please, for our panelists. And thank you to our audience members for attending uh, day one of this inaugural event at TR2 Forum. Uh, some of our guests have a dinner to get to, so unfortunately we're going to have to uh, wrap it up here. We'll see you all tomorrow, bright and early, for day two. Thank you.